have to wait till the countdown turn, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looks like everyone's here and ready to go. We are so glad that you are here with us today. Thank you uh, for being here with us. Thank you to those that are joining us on the internet as well. We had a few uh, technical glitches with that last week, but hopefully that'll be all fixed this week. I know a couple of people that were trying to watch last week had some some problems, so we apologize for that. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we want to be able to minister to whatever your needs are, so let us know what we can do, what we can pray for. If there's some need in your life that we can help to meet, the connection card on your bulletin is a great way for you to do that, so we just encourage you to do that. Uh, just a few announcements. Next week in the uh, the morning worship service, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. I know you'll, you'll want to be here and be a part of that. That's always, a, I know, an exciting time and a uh, a time to just reflect upon what Jesus has done for us. So we invite you to come and to be part of that. For you ladies, remember the uh, the ladies' night that's uh, coming up. And if you need some more information, you can see Cherise. And we encourage you to come and, and to be part of that as well. Uh, we will, as always, have a, an extended time for you to welcome each other and, and talk and get to know each other after the worship service. But let's go ahead and take a few moments to do that right now. So go ahead and stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus this morning. powerful and 
And we want to read some scriptures this morning that focus on God and, and His power and what He's able to do. So uh, these next scripture readings, some of them will be for the men, some of them for the women. So let's, let's just read from God's Word what the scriptures tell us that God is able to do. Let's begin with this one, men. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. To life, our God is 
about John the Baptist, and even though he had seen Jesus and seen all the things that he was able to do, when he was in prison, he began to have some doubts about that. And so he kind of questioned whether Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. He was really questioning, is God able to do what he promised? And here's what Jesus said. He said, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are, are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. So that's what we celebrate this morning.
mighty God, don't we? A God who can heal and a God who makes us alive. And we want to testify to the work that he's done in our lives this morning through this song, which is really our, our testimony of our belief in Jesus.
giving this morning, we acknowledge our dependence on God. With our gifts, we demonstrate that we agree with the words that the psalmist wrote. Our offertory scripture today is from Psalm 73, verses 25 through 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength and my, of my heart and my portion forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the many blessings that you have given us and, and all that you have provided for us. And Lord, we just pray for, uh, for this time of offering that you would uh, really open up our hearts and, and open up our giving and, and allow us to give back to you uh, just a portion of the many things that you've given back to us. And Lord, we pray that you use this offering uh, really for your will and, and for your good. And uh, it is in your great name that we pray. Amen. So we do pray that you would take during this time now as we open up your word and 
that would you, you would use your word in our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would take and, and make that word alive and active, that it would be profitable for teaching and rebuking and training and correcting in righteousness as you have promised, Father. Father, we, we give our lives to you and ask that you would use your word to mold them and transform them into what you want them to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. This morning we're going to be talking a lot about uh, our minds and what we think about and the things that, that kind of go into our minds. And, and here's the problem. When we live in a world around us, there's a lot of stuff out there that goes into our mind that it kind of makes our mind look like this cup of coffee right here. Kind of dark, huh? And the thing is, if those dark thoughts, if I, I think bad things, and I say, I want to get rid of those, God, if I just... If I just think, try not to think about them, they don't go away, do they? Or I could try to pour them out of my mind. So, so sometimes maybe I can pour a little bit of them out. And a little bit of it goes away, but the problem is what I still have left. It's still, my mind's still dirtied up with all those things that I shouldn't be thinking about. So if I really want to clean my mind out, what do I have to do? I have to replace what's in here with something else. And the way I primarily do that it's through the Word of God and thinking about the things that God has put in the Bible. So I'm going to have this water, this white, pure, clean water, represent our life, the Bible. And so what, look what happens is I pour it in there, and I keep pouring it in there. What's happening? That's getting less and less dark now, isn't it? And if I were to keep on pouring and pouring, eventually I would clean all that darkness out of there. Now it's pretty clean, isn't it? So if I want to think about the things of God, look at that, it's almost completely clean now, right? So what that shows us is if I want to think about the things of God, the way I do that is I don't try to get rid of everything else because it'll just come back and fill my mind up again. Well, what I want to do is to fill it with the Word of God. And here in the Bible it says to think about things that are true and noble and right and trustworthy, and those are the things of God. So let's pray and ask God help to help us to fill our minds with those kind of things. Father, we do pray that, that you'd help us to fill our minds with those things that, that are important to you, those things that would, would reflect you, Father. I pray that for these boys and girls and for all of us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. This morning we're going to wrap up our sermon series on the hard sayings of Jesus. And, and obviously in eight weeks we haven't covered all the hard stuff that Jesus said. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that's really hard to understand some of it. Some of it's hard to apply, but there, there's a lot of stuff. But I think together we've got a, a pretty good feel for what some of these hard things of, of Jesus, what they mean and how we're to take and to apply them in our lives. And I think if we took everything that we've learned and put it all together, here's... Here's kind of how I would summarize that. I would say, here's what we've learned, that becoming a disciple of Jesus and living according to the principles of His kingdom, it's a serious commitment. And it's a serious commitment to take and let Jesus radically transform our lives, and especially the way that we think and the things that are going through our mind. So, so it's not surprising that back in Jesus' day, as well as in in today's culture, there's not a lot of people who are necessarily willing to make that kind of commitment in their lives. We saw that, we've seen that with some of the hard sayings of Jesus. He said some things, and man, these people just all ran away. They said, we can't understand that, we can't live by that. And the same thing still happens in our world today. We've also seen in, in some of these hard sayings, we saw it especially a couple of weeks ago when Jesus talked about 
eating his flesh and drinking his blood, we see that Jesus used a lot of metaphors and a lot of pictures as he was speaking about the things of the kingdom. And so, so that made it in some ways even harder for some of the people to understand because he didn't just kind of lay it out there real clearly sometimes. We're going to see some more of that metaphorical language this morning as we look at this last of the, the hard sayings of Jesus that we're going to be looking at. So go ahead, take your Bibles, open up to, this morning to, uh, to Matthew chapter 5 once again. Uh, this morning, rather than just kind of reading the hard saying and then coming back to the context later, I'm going to, I'm going to read the whole passage this morning so we can kind of put this in its proper context. So, so Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, you can follow along as I read that. But you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, here's the hard, the hard statement, the hard saying, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than, than that your whole body be thrown into hell. <coughs> Excuse me, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, obviously, the hard saying here has to do with tearing out our eyes and, and cutting off our hands and throwing them away. And, and unfortunate, really, throughout history, there have been some, some Christians who really tried to kind of take this saying literally. And there, were, we, there, there are examples of Christians throughout history who actually decided that they, they would get rid of some sin in their life by cutting off some body part. Well, what they found is that, that because that's not what Jesus is saying here is that that really didn't work too well in, in helping them to overcome the sin in their lives. That's because here's, I think, what the main point that Jesus is trying to make here this morning in this passage, and that is this, that overcoming sin in my life is more a matter of heart work than it is of hard work. It's more a matter of heart work than hard work. Now, Jesus is is obviously dealing here with the specific sin of adultery. But I think the things that we can learn this morning, we can take and apply to whatever sin that we might be struggling with in our life. The principles that we're going to learn this morning work regardless of what that sin might be in our lives. We also know here that Jesus is he's in this section of the Sermon on the Mount where he's, he's really talking about the law and about how, how what really matters is our heart towards the law, not so much just the external things that that are going on. And Jesus began that, that whole section with these words that we see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says here, he says, man, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven based on what you can do, your righteousness has to be more than the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus is just confirming here what we've seen throughout this series, and that's this idea of of external religiosity is not adequate for us to enter the kingdom of heaven. I know most of us, we tend to have a fairly uh, negative view of the scribes and the Pharisees, don't we? And, and that's rightfully so in some ways, because Jesus goes around and he condemns them quite a bit. But, but actually in the culture of that day, those guys, they were the most, most righteous people, especially if you just looked at the externals. They, they were righteous. They followed all these things very religiously, they had that external religiosity. Well, what Jesus is saying here is that that's not adequate to enter into my kingdom. That's not an adequate way for you to live in my kingdom. So that's why we've seen over these last eight weeks that the only way to enter into that kingdom is by faith in Jesus Christ, by taking our trust and, and putting it totally on Him and what He did for us on the cross, that finished work on the cross, and on His resurrection, that we trust that He's made us righteous before God, that he's, he, he has taken His righteousness and, and given it to us so that when we stand before God, that we're righteous now. And what we also have seen is that when we live that kind of life, when we really have that kind of genuine faith, it's going to be reflected in the way that we live our lives. So externally, our lives will look more righteous because we have Jesus in them, but that external religiosity can never be our ticket into the kingdom of heaven. So with that in mind, let me kind of draw your attention to what I think is, is kind of the key verse in this whole passage. It'll help us to understand what Jesus is saying here. And that's, that's verse 28. So let's look at that verse again. 
Jesus said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, let me ask you a question here, and I don't, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but just think about this for a minute. When, according to Jesus, did the sin of adultery actually occur? I want you to think about that. When did the sin of adultery actually occur? Is it when the man looks at the woman? I mean, that, that verb there is in the present tense, the verb looks. And so a lot of commentators have kind of made a big deal about that. And they look at this passage and they say, well, well here's where the sin happened. It wasn't the first look, but it's when they, they turned around and they, they took that second gaze or that second look. And that that's where the sin really, really occurred. And, and while that's true, while it is true that, that there's something that happens when we take that second look, I, I would say that that's not yet exactly pinpointing when the sin has occurred. So, so is it the look? Or, or secondly, maybe it's this, this idea, it says here, with lustful intent. That, that literally means that, that phrase there literally means with the purpose of lusting. So is that when the sin actually occurs, when somebody had a purpose of lusting? As one point, commentator pointed out, he said, seeing a woman and being attracted to her is a natural part of the God-created appetite and a good indicator that one is alive. So what he's saying there is that, you know, if you're a guy and you see a good-looking woman and you don't notice that, you're probably not even alive. But he's saying that the, the problem it comes with the, the intent, that once there's lustful intent or there's a purpose of lusting there, that's when the sin actually occurs. Now, I think we're getting much closer, but we're not quite there. Notice the last part of this verse. It says this. When he does that, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Notice that already committed it. So here's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that the, the lustful gaze, that's just the manifestation of a problem of, of the heart that's already been going on. And, and really, the, the sin actually occurred back in the heart. When, when the person actually already had taken place, that sin had already taken place in the heart. Pastor John MacArthur puts it like this. He said this. He said, it's not lustful looking that causes the sin in the heart, but the sin in the heart that causes lustful looking. The lustful looking is but the expression of a heart that is already immoral and adulterous. The heart is the soil where the seeds of sin are embedded and begin to grow. I, I think he's hit it right on there. The problem is in the heart. It's not the external actions. They, they merely reflect the problem that, that we have in our heart. And you know what? Jesus confirms that truth. A little later in his ministry, we find these words in Mark chapter 7. He said this, what comes out of a person is what, de what, comes out of a person is what defiles him. For with from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, the sin that Jesus addressed here in, in Mark, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So what Jesus is saying there, he said, the problem isn't the external actions, it's the heart. It's a heart problem again. Sin always begins in the heart. So that's why overcoming sin in my life has to be a matter of heart work rather than just hard work. So when Jesus is talking about plucking out the eye or, or cutting off the hands, he's certainly not saying here that there's some physical solution to the problem of sin in our lives. He's not saying that, boy, whatever body part you use to sin, go ahead and just chop it off. That's not what Jesus is saying here. So what is he saying? Here's how I would summarize what Jesus says here. He says this, that sin is a serious matter with eternal consequences that must be dealt with radically. Sin is a serious matter with eternal consequences that must be dealt with radically. So, so let's take a moment just to look at each one of those phrases. How about the first one? He says, sin here is a serious matter. Jesus is telling the people, he's saying you have to take some definite action. And if you look at the commands that he makes here when he talks about taking out the eye and cutting off the hand, the, the form of those commands is, is something that indicates that it's, ha it's something that, that needs to be done now. There's an urgency to what God is, what Jesus is calling us to do. He says you need to do it right now because sin is a serious problem. 
And sin is a serious matter. It's serious to God. And frankly, until we begin, begin to see our sin the same way that God sees it, we're never going to be able to deal with it adequately. We need to come to the place where sin breaks our heart the same way it breaks God's heart because sin is a serious matter. Not only is it a serious matter, he tells us here that it has eternal consequences. Jesus said here, if you don't take care of that heart problem, if you don't take care of the sin, he said the end result is that your physical body is going to end up in a place that we call hell. And what Jesus is proving to us here is that, that, that hell is a physical place. It's not just some imaginary thing. It's a physical place. And that if we don't deal with our sin in the right way, he says that, that you will spend eternity in this place where there's physical torment. A lot of people out there like to think, well, I'll just live my life the way I want, and, and when I get done living my life, God's just going to annihilate me anyway, so there won't be any sense. Jesus says, no, that's not true. Sin has eternal consequences. That's another reason it it's such a serious matter, isn't it? So sin is a serious matter. It has eternal consequences. And finally, he says that we have to deal with it radically. Jesus isn't talking to here about physical surgery. Again, he's not talking about cutting off body parts here. I mean, think about it, really. He says, he says to remove the right eye and the right hand. Well, if I do that, is that going to keep me from lusting again? I still have another eye. I still have another hand. And even if I, if I continue to do that, since the problem's in my mind, cutting off body parts is not the solution here. It is significant here that Jesus talks about the right hand and the right eye because in the Hebrew mind, the right eye and the right ear and the right hand and arm and leg, those were all considered to be the superior part of the body. They were considered to be the very best part of the body. So here's what Jesus, I think, is, is saying here. He's saying if there's something in your life that's causing you to sin even if that's something really great, even if it's the very best thing in your life, you need to get rid of that out of your life. You need to deal with sin radically and seriously. In other words, Jesus is saying when it comes to sin, it needs to be cut off, not tapered off. And I think a lot of us, that's how we try to deal with sin. We try to taper it off. Well, I'll try to just sin a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. And Jesus says, no, you need to cut it off. You need to take care of it immediately. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 3. He said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. He goes on to list these sins. He says, put it to death. Get rid of it. Don't just, don't just try to make it less a part of your life. You have to get rid of it. And sometimes that needs, means we have to take some really serious action to get ourselves out of a place where we might be tempted to sin. Reminded of the guy that uh, had gone on a diet. And so he, he decided he wasn't going to go by the donut store every day on the way to work and pick up a dozen donuts. And so one day he'd been doing really well. One day he comes into the office with a dozen donuts and his co-worker says, what's the deal? I thought, thought you were on a diet. I thought you weren't going to eat these donuts anymore. He said, well, I just happened to be going by the donut shop this morning on the way to work. And I prayed to God and I said, God, if you want me to have donuts today, let there be a parking place right in front of the door. And he said, you know what? On the seventh time around the block, there it was. <laughs> or I think about there was a guy that uh, had quit smoking. And, and, and for him, that was a sin. And so he didn't want to smoke anymore. So what he did is he went and he dug a big old hole in his backyard. And he took all his cigarettes and all his lighters and his ashtrays and everything. He buried them down that hole and covered them all up. And then he put a big old rock right on top of it. So just in case he had to go back and find it again someday, he'd be able to do that. <laughs> now, neither, neither eating donuts nor smoking is a sin for everyone. It might be for some of us. But here's the point. We have to make sure that we don't make provision in our life to, to kind of be able to go back to whatever that sin might be in our life so that we're tempted to go back and, and engage in that sin again. So if there's some action that we can take to lessen the possibility of, of being dragged into sin, we ought to do that. But still, that's still not enough because as we've seen this morning, overcoming the sin in my life is a matter more of 
heart work than hard work. It's a matter of taking care of my heart rather than just the externals again. So the question then has to be, well, how do I do that? How do I do this hard work? So let me see if we can't get a little bit better handle on what that ought to look like in our lives. Now, here's the good news. The hard work that I'm talking about here, we don't have to do it alone. As a matter of fact, it's really not, in a sense, it's not even our work. It's God's work. I mean, think about it. We have a couple of advantages that, that make this possible in our life. The first thing is that the Scriptures tell us that when we give our lives to Jesus, when we become His disciple, that we actually get a new mind. We get the mind of Christ. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him, but we have the mind of Christ. So we, we have the mind of Christ. The second advantage we have is that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. The very moment that we become a disciple of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell permanently in our lives. That's why Paul could again write this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? The word there to dwell means that He comes to take up permanent residence there. So having the mind of Christ, having the Holy Spirit dwell in our lives means it's possible to develop a heart that's going to help me to overcome the sin in my life. And that God is the one who really does the work here. But while God does the work, it's also true that I play an important role in that process. It's not like I can just kind of sit back and say, God, change, change my heart now and, the, and, and just kind of figure He's going to do everything by osmosis. So I don't want to in any way diminish the fact that this is God's work. That, that's true, absolutely true. But what I do want to do is focus on what our part in the process is because that's that's what we can really control. Would you agree that that's the part we can control? So what's our part in the process? I think Paul gives us a pretty good idea in his letter to the, to the Roman church. He writes this in Romans chapter 6. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Now notice three commands here in these verses. The first two are worded negatively. He says here, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Do not present your members to sin. Well, that's hard. How do I do that? Well, the third command, which is worded in a positive manner, I think tells us how to do it. What he says here, the way you, the way you obey those commands is you make sure you develop a mindset in which you're constantly and consisting, consistently presenting your entire life to God, remembering that He's brought you from death to life. So it's, a, it's a, a matter of the mindset that we develop here. And Paul communicates that same truth in a slightly different way a little later in the, in the book of Romans as well. In chapter 13, he says this, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, to gratify its desire. So this time he kind of flips the thing. He begins with this, this positive command and then ends with the negative one. Now the positive command here where he says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously he's not saying that's something we can physically do. Again, he's speaking about a mindset in which we put on Jesus when we, we want to make sure that we think like Jesus, that, that, that his mind is, is our mind there. And that we develop a mindset that's consistently tied to Jesus. I want to illustrate how, how we can do that here with a, a video here in just a moment. And, and this video, Frank, it's a little bit longer than ones I usually like to use for sermon illustrations. But I couldn't really cut any part of it out as I think you'll see in just a moment. Because you really need to see the whole thing to get the point. But here's what I want to... I want to encourage you to do as you watch this video. It's, it's entertaining in some ways, but I want you to think about what does this teach me about my mindset and how I develop a mindset that will be consistent with the things of Jesus. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. 
Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often. But I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. So here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. Any small distractions at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the old control algorithm and I would wreck. But at least I could ride it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike log. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a Smarter Everyday Meetup, if you will, and I'm gonna see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm gonna try to ride a normal bike. <laughs> it's 
It's backwards. It's backwards. This was one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that bias. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American <laughs> that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm back. Oh, it clicked. It clicked. Hold it, it clicked. I got it, I got it. Okay, there it is. There was the moment. Okay, I can ride a bike. I tried to explain this to the people around me, and they just didn't get it. They thought I was faking the previous 20 minutes, and I couldn't get anybody to believe me. That looked like I faked that, didn't it? Yeah. Just a fake. You think I'm faking. You don't believe me. They've been so weird to you like, la, 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 and it's full. You think I'm lying, don't you? Yeah, I I'm not lying. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin, you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Okay, if you want to... Let's just think about Maybe a couple of things that we learned from that video. At the end of the video, remember what Destin said, and I think he's right about this. He said, all of us are looking at the world with a bias. And that's true. That's essentially what we've learned over the last eight weeks with these hard sayings of Jesus. Every person chooses whether we're going to look at the world as a, as a citizen of this world or whether we're going to look at it as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And those two things are completely different. And I think the, the video did a pretty good job of kind of pointing out what some of those contrasts were. I think that the kingdom of God is a lot like that backwards bicycle, if you think about it. Things in the kingdom of God tend to operate in a way that's completely contrary to the things of this world. So operating in, in God's kingdom, sometimes it's just as difficult as trying to ride the backwards bicycle was for him. That's because our minds have been programmed by, by our time in this world, by the things that are going on around us. And we, we get into a certain mindset, and it's hard to get out of that. As Dustin said in the video, he said, once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that even if you want to. And I think we find that's true sometimes, isn't it? But as we also in the, saw in the video, with the proper training, it is possible to eventually change our mindset. It might take a long time to do that. And, and like Destin said in the video, it means that sometimes while we're trying to do that, people are going to make fun of us. It means that sometimes we're going to be distracted and we're going to go back to that old way of thinking. And I think that just reminds us that becoming a disciple of Jesus is a process. And we're going to have some setbacks along the way, and, and that's okay just as long as we're making consistent progress towards becoming the kind of disciple that Jesus wants us to be. As we saw with his son, we also see that, that the longer that we live in this world, the harder it is for us to change that mindset. See, his son at, at six years old, he had a much easier time changing his mindset than his father did. And, and so that's just, a, I think, a reminder to us that, that when we're called to come and to be a part of the kingdom of God, we don't ever want to put that off. Because the longer we put it off, the harder it becomes to change that mindset and to, and to develop the kind of mindset that we need to have to live within the kingdom of God. And then finally, we saw at the end of the video that it is always possible for us to revert back to that old way of thinking. But the thing is, the longer and the more consistently that we adhere to the new way of thinking, the less likely it is that we're going to revert back to that old way of thinking. I think more than anything, this video reminds us that 
doing the heart work that's required to overcome sin. It's a matter of, of really guarding what we allow to go into our minds and to make sure that, that we guard that closely. And while it's important to filter out the bad stuff, like I talked with the kids this morning, What's even more important is that we're consistently filling our minds with the things of the kingdom of heaven. So as a reminder of how we're to do that, as we close our time this morning, will you stand with me? And let's read this verse out loud together. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Let's pray as we close our time. Father, we do pray that you would help us to, to keep our minds focused on these things. Father, help us to, to fill our minds with the things of your kingdom, Father, so that, that our mindset would be changed in a way that it would think consistently with who you are and with what your kingdom is like. Father, thank you that we don't have to do that work alone. Thank you that you tell us, you promise that we have the mind of Christ. And you promise that we have your Holy Spirit living within us. Father, thank you for that. We, uh, we just pray that you would help us to take the things that we've learned for these past eight weeks and apply them in our lives so that we might be functioning citizens of your kingdom. We pray that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.